This morning, I am very happy and honored that those three people, Michaela Gray, Adrian Chavez, and our videographer, Mike, Mike Swick, they are, uh, Mike is from LA, member of the Japanese American Civil uh, Citizens League, which I believe Japan is the attacked Pearl oldest, Harbor. one of the oldest um, civil rights, Asian civil rights movement. And Michaela and Adrian are originally from Clovis, New Mexico. Do we have anybody from Clovis? Anybody who has a family members or have been there or over there, right? So this is your friend talking to us, all right. Oh, be careful clapping. I haven't spoken yet. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to, I, it was cool to see that there was actually maybe like four or five people that actually knew where Clovis was, but we were associated more with being on the border and also an Air Force town called Cannon Air Force Base, so that might kind of tell you where we're at a little bit more. Um, my name is Mike LeGray, and this is Adrian Chavis, and we've come here today to talk about a group of kids that you have never met. They were children from long ago that lived a few hours from here on railroad property where their dads worked. By now you may be asking what that has to do with you. When Adrian and I found these kids hidden in the pages of the untold past, we were wondering the same thing. What does this have to do with us? I'm the daughter of a Clovis railroader and the story I'm about to tell you I'd never heard. Adrian called me and began to include me in the journey that led us to you the first young people we have ever been asked to speak to about this. You see, it is our story, all of us. It's about executive order, uh, which was issued on February 19th, 1942, and it was basically rounding up all the uh, Japanese American people uh, from the West Coast, from the coast especially. But the story I'm about to tell you actually happens and is the only story that happens this way about a month prior to that, not quite a month. Um, this, just a couple of days ago, marked the anniversary of this executive order. Back then, people were not able to communicate as freely then as we do now, and in a split second, I have access to information as you do, simply by using a cell phone or the internet. World War II was a time of great hysteria and panic. All Japanese, even American descent, were viewed as possible enemies. Even children became victims of a shameful time in American history. There was no way to Google or fact check what was happening. There was Pearl Harbor December 7th, and on December 8th, the next attack would happen by Japan on a place called Bataan. Clovis, New Mexico is a small, small town that borders Texas, and if you listen on a real quiet night, you'll hear the train whistles across town. The railroad built that place, and in 1968, it would hire you right out of high school during the Vietnam War. Um, and you know what? That's exactly what my dad did. But many years later, one fall day in 2013, Adrian called me up and he asked if I'd ever heard anything from my railroad dad, maybe, about a group of Japanese American railroaders. They were machinists who had lived on the railroad property with their families during World War II. He told me there were 32 people there, including their children, and one very pregnant woman who would make the number of the children soon 17. I didn't know what he was talking about, but I had an idea the one place that you could go to look where a Japanese name would stand out, the cemetery. If they existed, then I'd know they were buried somewhere and a Japanese name would stick out. And on November of 2013, on the windiest day we could probably pick, we arrived at the older of two cemeteries in town. There, as I suspected, were the tiny graves of names that stood out from back even in the 20s with the Japanese lettering even on the back of where their names were written in English, and I began to put my hands on that kanji. These were our 17. They were, they were connected to them, but they weren't our actual 17. They were siblings who died before World War II. I wanted to know what had happened and the story of how these people in one night, January 23rd, 1942, had just disappeared. This is what happened. 1941 started off in Clovis pretty routine for these 16 kids. Roy Ibahara was eight then. His siblings, along with his friend 11-year-old Lily Kimura's siblings, and, and she attended school, rode bikes, played sports, went to church, and they even had friends of different races like you all do. 
Their mothers had gardens and sold vegetables to the other neighbors. They came to their compound on the railroad land. This place was secluded from the rest of town, however, and was referred to by the locals as Jap Camp or Jap Town. Lily and Fred Kimura's parents also had an additional storefront located inside of Fox Drug Store. It was an Anglo-owned drug store. There they'd sold goods that must have seemed quite exotic to Clovis. It would even seem exotic now to us. Mr. Kimura also had the only car anyone in the group had, and Fred and Lily both told me that their father loved to go to town to the pool hall with the other railroaders and play a game of pool. Sometimes Lily would sneak onto this old car, and she says she would hold onto the passenger side, standing on the side rails and leaning down where he couldn't see her through the window of the passenger side. But once he got to the pool hall, he'd really be mad because he'd catch her and he'd have to take her back home to her mom. And eventually they'd just give in and get her her own turquoise bicycle for her 12th birthday. So she'd have her own wheels. But by January 22, 1942, the town had become like any field catching fire with the winds of panic spreading it. From the moment December 7, 1941 had been heard over the radios, the words Pearl Harbor had changed the entire world. But adding the bombing in the very next day of December 8th on the island of Bataan in the Philippines and Clovis, New Mexico reached a breaking point. Many young men were trapped there on Bataan and they had called Clovis, New Mexico and the surrounding areas including Albuquerque, Berlin, Las Lunas, small towns that I can't even count now. Many men were trapped there. In fact, Lily Kimura's best friend, Maola Drake, had a brother on Bataan as this all unfolded. <clears throat> Mela's brother, Mela's mother was beside herself with worry for her son, Corporal Drake, and she forbid Mela to play with Lily Kimura or any child that was Japanese. Lily's mother, trying to protect her, also advised Lily Kimura against this. But those two little girls that were born 60 days apart refused at the age of some of you 6th and 7th graders to listen and continued their hidden friendship School was precious to them because they had those days where they could hang out together. They even made honor roll together. They were happy and they were clueless that their days together were about to end. Roy Bahar had memories at the age of eight of playing with others and his dog. He loved catching tarantulas and selling little cactuses and old Campbell's soup cans to train passengers that were passing through. At that time, it wasn't just a station. They actually, people came through, not just uh, cargo. Sometimes the passengers would assume that the darker-skinned Japanese children were Native Americans. Roy and them went with it. Roy's brother would take the advantage of his, father's, his father being a railroad employee, and he would take free passes and attend the out-of-town Clovis High School football games with the other high school students. By January 1942, all over America, banks were shutting down access to Japanese Americans' funds. It had no access to any cash. Illegal searches of their homes by the government and law enforcement were in full force. The railroads were all sending home their Japanese American employees. They didn't want someone that they wrongly saw as the enemy sabotaging the trains instead of fixing the engines. In Clovis, the Japanese were told to remain confined to their homes on railroad property. Although I have read accounts written by the government by immigration and naturalization services from that time period exactly, where I will recount the following events from January 23rd, 1942, as told to me by my friend Roy Bahara when he was eight years old, from his eight-year-old memory. Roy woke up to chaos. Several men had shown up and without warning. As the uninvited men came through the door, they began looking at all their things, going through all of their things. They destroyed their radio. They took the family's hunting rifle, and then the men also shot Roy's dog in front of him. He carried the dog quickly, knowing he didn't have much time, and he buried him. Amy, who was 17 years old, his sister, was trying to help. She was able to speak English very well, and her immigrant parents were in panic, and she was trying to translate this na nightmare that she was trying to remain calm in. The families were told a lynch mob was forming nearby in the very tunnels that Lily Kimura had just ridden her new bike in. Can you imagine, even these kids like you, were facing death at the hands of other Americans? 
The government officials were on site during this and had three black cars ready to take 32 frightened people away. That's right, they just happened to have three black cars ready to go. Now remember you guys, this is January 23rd. The executive order has not been issued yet. Suddenly, Lily's mother went into labor. Lily was left to pack one suitcase. Remember, she's just, she's not even a teenager yet. She's left to pack, a, pack one suitcase for her entire family. Her, her other sister, Blanche, was allowed to stay behind while their mother was in the hospital. My understanding is that until that birth, all children of those families had been delivered at home or with the help of the veterinarian. Lily remembers how overwhelming it was to try to decide what to take for so many people in a small suitcase. And just like that, in the dark, they were gone. The new bicycle, not a week old, lay barely used. The Kimura's car was seized and no one knows who ended up with it. And no one knows who kept the bicycle or any of their belongings. What I do know is this. Mr. Kimura never took his family in his car and left the others. He chose to stay with a pregnant wife and 30 others. As the cars drove down the dirt road with their lights off, they were leaving empty school desks, empty church pews, and some stories that would need to be told to add a page to the truth of American history books that seemed so blank. Mayla Drake would come to learn Lily had been taken prisoner that's right, all 17, even the newborn, Richard Kimura, were now POWs. By April, Mayola's family also had received word about her, her big brother, Corporal Drake. After being wounded and captured by the enemy Japanese on Bataan, he had been involved in what is now known as the Bataan Death March. If men didn't die along this brutal and long march, many died in POW camps. Corporal Drake made it to the camp, but would die on October 24th. 1942. Mayola's best friend, Lily, had been a POW in America, while Mayola's brother was a POW in the Philippines. Mayola never saw her brother again. She never saw Lily again. She would pass away, elderly, and remembering a little Japanese-American girl who she still called her best friend. To this day, in her 90s, Lily Kimura Kawakawa still remembers a little Anglo girl named Mayola Drake as her best friend. As the sun rose, those black cars had arrived at a place January 24th called Fort Stanton, and 17-year-old Amy Ibahara then began her early career speaking out, and, became, and because German POWs who were merchant marines were being kept at that very camp, she explained how dangerous that could be for women and children. That very day, the INS officials in charge moved them to an old civilian conservation corp facility called Baca Raton Camp. Baca Ranch Camp, pardon me. Now Baca in Japanese translates to fool or idiot. They were 32 alone, but in the mountains setting far away from the harm of a lynch mob. By November 24, 1942, these families would be sent to separate camps. Ibaharas would go to Topaz, the Kimuras to Poston, the other family and a few single men would go to Gila River. To Roy Ibahara, Topaz was the most horrifying experience. He recalls barbed wire fences and towers with military guards and machine guns. The other Japanese Americans that were already there made fun of Roy and the rest of them because they had Texas accents. Imagine you're Japanese and you show up, hey y'all, okay? That's probably not going to be really popular either because the very people that said, hey y'all, put you in that prison, right? Amy and, Amy and Henry, the older, learned the system and began submitting work release applications, which in turn helped the family to be relocated to Cleveland, Ohio in the fall of 1943. By the way, all these years later, one day I was mentioning to my very best friend about five years ago, the address on the envelope there in Ohio. She lived three blocks from Roy Ibahara. Henry wrote on an open letter to President Roosevelt asking for the ban to be lifted on the East Say. That's first generation Japanese that had come because he had not actually been born. He'd come as a young child. He wanted to serve his adopted country. He, reserved, he, he received special clearance. And in 1945, when the occupation of Japan actually commenced, he was a special agent for America in the CIA. 
1993, Henry Bahara wrote a letter. He wrote a letter home to Clovis, New Mexico. When Adrian and I couldn't figure out what to say, Adrian decided to use the voice of a man that's been gone. He's passed away. He read in 2013 to the mayor. It's the very letter that caused the Clovis's mayor and the entire city commission to unanimously vote and bring Roy Ibahara and Lily and Fred Kimura back to Clovis. They represented 32 people taken and were given an apology and keys to the city. More importantly today, they represent approximately 120,000 Japanese Americans, which by the way, not one of those human beings was ever convicted of a wrongdoing. They never did any crime. Since Henry Bahar is no longer with us on this earth, I'll now ask again for Adrian to bring him to life with this letter. Adrian Chavez. Thank you. Um, real quick, how I got involved. I got involved because I was going back to school in 2012 and I was taking a political science course. Uh, I was taking a history class and my history teacher happened to be married to a Japanese American out of Gallup. And she told me the story of the Clovis population of Japanese Americans being raised at the time. We had no clue. We, we never heard that story. I don't know why I did it and I just thought about that a while ago. I went to Clovis, drove out there and just asked the mayor, have you ever heard of this story? And he said, I think my mom talked about it. I believe his mother was a, a teacher at the time or had been a teacher later. They knew little bits and pieces. It's kind of, it's kind of a hush-hush deal. You know, it's not something that any community is proud to have been a part of. Um, but I told him the story, and I explained to him what I had learned. And he looks at me and goes, "Adrian, what are you doing tomorrow night?" And I said, uh, "Well, I got to go back because I got school. I just came down here to tell you this." <laughs> and the next thing I know is he said, "Can, can you stay another night?" And I said, "For what? We, uh, would you mind sharing this with the with the city council?" And I said okay and so I stayed and uh, I didn't know what I was gonna say I, I just thought well I'll just say what I told him and maybe that'll suffice before I left I received a letter from Dr. Roy Ibarra somebody she spoke about that was one of the children born there previously and uh, I opened the letter and I read it and I just it blew me away and I, I remember sitting in my in front of my computer and just tears started coming down my face because one I'm from Clovis I know how people are, and it affected me that way because I felt like I could feel his pain. And with that being said, I'm gonna read the letter. When I read it to the city council, and of course I'm reading, and I look up, there wasn't a single dry eye in that entire room, and these are grown people. And the reason being is because this child was taken away from his community, and all he's asking for is just forgiveness. So with that being said, I'm gonna read Henry about his letter. I'm old and my vision, I, can't, I can only see with my glasses. In the twilight of my life, my thoughts often return to my childhood and adolescence in Clovis, New Mexico, where I attended at schools from first grade through high school. I think my dear friends who grew up with me, some already dead, some who moved away, and some still living in Clovis or other areas of New Mexico. I recall with a great deal of nostalgia my teachers who not only gave me a good education start, but also some solid American values which sustained me throughout my adult life. I was a fervent, fervent fan and rooter for our high school, Clovis High School Wildcats, and often traveled with the football team all over the state because I got to travel for free on the Santa Fe Rail Yard by virtue of my father's employment with the Santa Fe Railroad. I consider my childhood and adolescence in Clovis as the experience of a typical American boy. All this was shattered one day by one unbelievably episode of horror. My family's life turned into a living nightmare on December 7, 1941, when Japanese planes attacked Pearl Harbor in a sudden sneak attack. We were just as horrified and outraged by this dastardly act as our fellow Americans. How dare they attack our beloved country? While this day was a day of infamy in the annals of our American history, Another infamy of more personal nature was being visited upon my family and the other Japanese residents of Clovis, New Mexico, who had lived and worked in this town for over two decades. During this period, children were born to them who attended the public schools, swore allegiance to the American flag, and then bonded with their white classmates in close friendships. 
Suddenly, these Japanese families and their children became social pariahs, unwanted, abused, and rejected by the good people of Clovis, who never stopped to think that we did not start this war and that we were just as angry and outraged as, as they were about this attack. They forgot that we were multiracial, multi-ethnic, and a multicultural nation. In times of war, we have always come together as one American brotherhood to fight against our foreign enemies, whether they be Germans, Italians, Japanese, Koreans, or North Vietnamese. On December 7, 1941, we became identified as one and the same with our hated enemy who bombed Pearl Harbor. I am aware that Clovis lost many good men at Pearl Harbor, and in the innumerable battles that followed, many of them were my friends, my classmates from Clovis High School. I too grieved over these irreplaceable losses and wanted terribly to avenge their death. Threats of violence and bodily harm to my family and other Japanese families by local hotheads quickly became moved, quickly moved the agents of the United States Department of Justice to evacuate them from this hostile town to the long abandoned CCC camp near Carrizozo, New Mexico, known as Baca Raton Camp. The last thing our country wanted while fighting a righteous war against the totalitarian dictators of Germany, Italy, and Japan was to have a massacre of its innocent residents of Clovis because they happened to be the, of, of a Japanese race. In the tumult of war hysteria following the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and the enemy assaults upon our Philippine bastions, we Americans of Japanese ancestry became the target of targets of our country's frustration. The saddest part of the exodus of the Japanese families from Clovis was a sudden disruption of our children's education, sudden separation from their white friends, and the denial of public education to them by the Lincoln County School Board, who had responsibility over the area encompassed by the Baca Raton camp. What kind of message was this giving these children who were pledging allegiance to the Stars and Stripes and who had been indoctrinated in American ways. I know that the children of my family kept up their faith, loyalty, and trust in this country, even though their country was letting them down by treating them like hated enemy. I was separated from my family at that time because I went to California to seek work. Work was very scarce in Clovis during those depression years when World War II started. All of us were of Japanese ancestry. Aliens and citizens alike were forced at gunpoint into inland concentration camps. The Japanese residing in the Hawaiian Islands did not suffer the same fate because the commanding general of the American forces in Hawaii did not succumb to the same wartime hysteria afflicting the people of the West Coast and New Mexico. Instead, the Japanese residents who outnumbered all other minorities in Hawaii were used to man the Hawaiian defenses against expected follow-up attacks by the Japanese Navy. The 100th Infantry Battalion, comp comprised of all Japanese Americans, was organized during the early phase of the World War II. The exploits of this Hawaiian Japanese battalion on the Italian battlefields encouraged our War Department to develop a larger Japanese American unit, and this was the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, which soon became the most decorated military unit and incurring the greatest number of casualties for its size in the battlefields of Europe. After my family members joined me in the Utah concentration camp, I wrote to President Roosevelt in February of 1943 requesting his help toward my enlistment in the newly organized Japanese American unit. Although I came to America as an infant, I could not become a naturalized citizen because our Congress continued to bar aliens of Asian origin from citizenship although they extended the naturalization rights for former slaves of African descent in 1870. Thus, only those born on the American soil had citizenship. President Roosevelt made a special exception for me to join the armed forces. As the war in Europe was winding down, the need for military personnel versed in Japanese language skills was an acute need to pursue the war in the Pacific, although my Japanese language skills were rather mediocre at that time. 
The Army sent me to their military intelligence language school for an intensive six month study of the Japanese language as well as the intelligence duties. After World War II ended, I re-enlisted as a special agent of the Counterintelligent Corps, attached to the general headquarters of General MacArthur, and saw duty in Jap Japan and Korea. I reiterate that the children in my family maintain their faith in this country and remain steadfastly loyal. My two brothers also served in the U.S. Army. One of them fought in, Korea, in the Korean War. The pain inflicted on us by our fellow Americans was at times unbearable. Do you know the feeling of a child who had been rejected and abused by his parents? He tries his darndest to win the approval of his parents no matter how many times he gets slapped around. I know that the children in our family tried very hard against overwhelming obstacles to serve our country loyally and faithfully and to become its useful and contributing citizens worthy of being considered Americans. Like the rejected child, we still need the affirm affirmation and acceptance from the good people of Clovis that they want to take us back. That was why I was overjoyed when my best friend from childhood days in Clovis finally located me recently, and we were able to renew our close friendship of old. Despite the loss of one year of public education by those Japanese children at the Baca Raton camp because of the refusal of the Lincoln County <coughs> School Board or Board of Education to assume responsibility for their education even though they were American citizens and citizens of the state of New Mexico. My siblings managed to make up for their lost educational time after their release from the Utah concentration camp. Toward the end of the World War II, toward the end of World War II, they were scattered now to various parts of the United States where they found new roots got married and became parents to a new generation of Americans. We are now the older generation to our, to our children who have grown up to become fine, upstanding Americans that anyone can be proud of. However, Clovis will always be remembered by us as our home despite the painful memory of our expulsion in January 1942. Can we please return home again and be welcomed back as the beloved, not rejected, children of our former Clovis. And out of this family group, just real quickly, one of them became, I think she invented the bell bottoms. You guys? She invented fashion she, denim. Yeah, she invented fashion denim. Very well, well known throughout the country. Her name was Amy. Henry, this guy, worked for NASA. Their father, the one that worked at the rail yard, he became the first Japanese American that was allowed to work in a functioning wartime <laughs> facility. So Clovis lost a lot of really good people. And I think it's really important to remember in today's society that it's really important to remember we're all human beings, man. We're all here. We need to help each other out. And I want to thank Manal School for allowing us to come and speak and to share our story. I think it's a great opportunity, especially in today's time, to remind ourselves how important we all are to each other and to our country. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for listening carefully. Please carry this story with you. I know it will lead you to your future in a very important way. And uh, Michael and Adrian will be available for in the, in the refectory over lunch. All right, let's thank him again. Okay. I'd said this earlier to the group of the ethics students, but we had a long time ago decided that it wasn't the adults that needed to hear the story as much as the people that I had hope in. I said, I need new leaders. I need positive examples. And I need hope. And five years ago, this moment, God saw this. And you're the first kids that he ever brought me to because you're my leaders. And you're my hope. Have hope in each other because I've got hope in you. Also, I want you to like me, like I said, because when I get old, I need the people in charge to like me. <laughs> Thank you. Go in peace.